Yes, when I was younger uh, in L.A., uh, you know, when I had an apartment off of Sunset Boulevard, we all had to have day jobs, you know. I was a sound man. I did sound at uh, the Lingerie. I did sound at the Roxy Whiskey, Madame Wong's. I did them all. And when I got my Guns N' Roses gig, I actually was doing sound at uh, the Club Lingerie at that time. I actually had to call in sick two nights in a row to go audition for the band. <laughs> Gilby Clark. Awesome. That's actually an interesting story. Some of the songs from Pawn Shop Guitars uh, we're actually going to be for the next Kill for Thrills record. <laughs> uh, some of them I was writing for the next Guns N' Roses record because we were on the road for two and a half years. So we were writing songs and we did have a plan when the tour was over to go in and make a record. So all of us were showing each other ideas. So I did bring in uh, uh, Tijuana Jail, Black, Skin and Bones, all those songs to Axel and Slash and they passed. You know, they just said, look, well, Axel's opinion was, I really want to take guns in a new direction. I want to be a little bit more experimental about things. And uh, he really didn't want to make that same bluesy rock record anymore, you know, which I understood where he's coming from. But for me, it just, you know, my specialty was bluesy rock, <laughs> you know, kind of, you know, stonesy rock and roll was what I did. So yes, I did bring those songs to the band. Um, a couple of the songs actually appeared on Slash the Snake Pit record, um, but a lot of them, you know, I you know put on my Pawn Shop Guitars record. So they did start as some of them started as Guns N' Roses songs and became some of the songs. Well, for me, when I experienced South America with Guns N' Roses, and for us. Uh, like once again, it was a dream come true. You know, we were playing 80,000 seat or, or stadiums. You know, five nights in a row. It was just ridiculous. We had thousands of kids outside the hotel. So for myself, I was the first one that came back after that from that made a, a new record, which was Pawn Shop Guitars. And I actually uh, played with Aerosmith in an 80,000 seat stadium and had I didn't have thousands of kids outside the hotel, but hundreds of kids was still pretty good. Um, and I did notice that change of this is a younger audience. You know, in the States, it's not a younger audience. And like you said, Europe is not a younger audience. You know, they grow with you. But in South America, we're talking Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay. They are, it's a young audience. You look out and, and they're 12, 13, 14 years old. And, but they didn't get every record that the American labels put out. You know, they only got the Ramones, Guns N' Roses, Madonna, The Rolling Stones, and Metallica. <laughs> Later they got Motorhead. <laughs> so we were a little lucky that we got to experience that, you know, firsthand where myself, you know, as a solo act, I could go down there and play five nights at a theater, which was just ridiculous, where, like you said, here we'd be playing a club, you know. Wow, that's a very good question. Uh, do I think that... Uh, the kind of music I like, uh, you know, uh, T-Rex, Bowie, uh, New York Dolls. I honestly don't know if it's ever gonna hit the mainstream, you know, like sell millions of records. It, it will always take a, some band to interpret it. I mean, when you look at a band like Hanoi Rocks, which really wasn't a, a commercial successful band, you know, Guns N' Roses used a lot of those ideas of Hanoi Rocks and became a massive, you know, band. But Guns N' Roses had Sweet Child of Mine, which really helped that band, you know, become a big band and stuff where, you know, Hanoi Rocks never had that. It really, I think, still gets down to songs. I still go by the theory of a good song is a good song. If I stood here right now and I go, I have this great song called Imagine <laughs> and played it for you, you'd go, that's a great song and it would be a hit. And I really do believe that it still starts there. So it, yes, if there is a young band in America that uses those influences and writes a great song, I do believe that it can be successful. I, I think if it's a blatant, you know, New York Dolls, you know, kind of band, I think it's going to be hard, you know. But it does seem that Europe, South America, uh, Japan, they, they, um, 
They're a little more open-minded than America. You know, America gets what's shoved down their throats and they don't explore as much musically. Um, what do I think about bands going out with one original member? Uh, I have a divided answer because as a working musician, it's extremely hard to make a living as a musician these days. Um, a lot of us, as later in life, you know, we have families, we have mortgages, we have car payments, we have a lot of responsibilities. We don't get to make those artistic decisions that we got to make when we were 19 to 30 years old, you know? And how, what, how I honestly feel about it as an artist and as a musician is I don't love it. I really don't. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't like the idea of going to see ACDC with one or two guys in the band, you know? I don't like going to see Pink Floyd with one or two guys in the band. I mean, look, all these other musicians that are part of it are credible musicians, they're talented musicians, they deserve a break, they deserve to work. I get that, I get that. It's just that it gets to a point now where you know, is it really the band anymore? And that's how I honestly feel about it, you know? It's part of the game. You know, uh, I uh, had to deal with that when I made my first solo record. You know, I would like to just, I would like to stand on my own mare and go, look, Gilby Clark, let's put Guns N' Roses behind me. Look, if it sells five records, it sells five records. It sells, you know, 100,000, it sells 100,000. I don't like the idea you have to put X Guns N' Roses on it, but they're gonna do whatever they can to sell a ticket or sell a record. And 98% of the, that, the time, that is not my choice. You know, if you look on my own website, my own Facebook page, you don't see X Guns N' Roses, you don't even see a logo, you, you never even see the connection on there. But I don't have control of those kind of things, you know, when they're trying to sell tickets to a show and things like that. I make my money uh, mostly by performing live with my band or Kings of Chaos or a corporate show. Uh, number two is producing music. I don't really write, co-write with people anymore. I did that for a while and it just wasn't for me personally. But producing bands, I have my own recording studio so I can produce bands, records, songs, whatever it is. Um, uh, number three, uh, let me see. That's re uh, well, royalties. <laughs> royalties, you know, is really the main thing. There are a lot of guys that uh, write music for TV shows, uh, movies, and things like that. I have done that before. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have done that before, um, but I don't do it anymore. Um, it has to kind of be, for me, the perfect situation. When you're working with a, a top-notch uh, movie, it's fairly easy. They know what they want and they give you good direction. When you're uh, working with lower budget stuff, they don't know what they want and they give you no direction and you're kind of chasing your tail. Because it's not like you're gonna say, uh, oh, they want a song that sounds like Honky Tonk Woman, you know. They don't know what they want and you just have to keep throwing stuff out. It's extremely time consuming. <laughs> you can go for months where you're not earning any money trying to get things to earn that little bit of money. So I don't do it that much. I mean, I, I don't do jingles. Um, like, times do come up where I do, you know, write for a movie, but it's when it's, you know, the director knows what he wants and things like that. But mainly, yeah, it's, it's live shows, uh, you know, merchandise from live shows uh, and, uh, you know, uh, producing music. I'm extremely happy that there is a younger generation uh, that are uh, starting rock bands and uh, getting out there and writing songs and performing. Because it, rock music isn't gonna survive if we don't have the younger generation. It, we did our job. We grew up on Led Zeppelin, Kiss, and Aerosmith, and we did our job in our bands through the 80s and 90s, and we do need this generation to do it. Um, it's very strange for them because they don't have the backing of the major labels that we had where, you know, a major label's putting a million dollars into your band for marketing and promotion. But the younger generation is much better at marketing and promoting than we ever were. And even the people that did it for us, you know, you know, a video here and a performance there. So I think the quality is a lot better nowadays for the younger generation. Um, I think it's great 
that there are bands, uh, you know, that Faster Pussycat is still out there playing, LA Guns is still out there playing, uh, Warrant is still out there playing, you know, Guns N' Roses is still out there playing. I think it's wonderful. I think it's great that there's younger fans that, en that enjoy the music. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy. I mean, I took my daughter when she was a young girl to see Iggy Pop, to see Kiss. <laughs> we took her everywhere. Her first steps were on a moving tour bus. So she, uh, she definitely got the rock and roll education.